Well, I want to, uh, on behalf of the uh, Historical Society of Hamilton, want to uh, welcome. This is our opening uh, pr uh, program, opening lecture series for our 2011-2012 uh, series. I don't know how many years we've been doing this, but uh, that we, uh, for you, use of you, maybe have not been here too often. We just have had some excellent uh, programs and excellent speakers, and what we're trying to do is to gather together segments of our history, and not only to gather it together, but uh, thanks to people like Harry Stafford to be able to record it. So that not only that uh, maybe you can one day that uh, go into our museum, and if you want to hear Sam Kershaw's uh, talk, you can push Sam and then uh, and hear that one. Also, is going to be is also going to be uh, run at some point on the Channel Nine. And so we've had some great, great programs. And so uh, what better way to kick off our season but with tonight's speaker? Um, because that uh, Bob Penza and the Penza family and uh, Eastern Brewing were vital parts of our community for many, many years. Not only vital, but they were benevolent, too. And they were supporters of uh, all that went on. Um, so that we have, as, they're, as a regional beer distributor, they have hi highly successful in that area, that Charles Penza, the, he was Republican County uh, Chairman for many, many years, and uh, so forth, and so a lot of colorful history with that. So uh, it's a pleasure tonight to have, uh, have uh, one of the Penza family to speak of it, and uh, Bob actually wrote a book, Reflections of a Brewmaster, and uh, with that, that he chronicles the whole story that goes from uh, the 1930s, should I say, all the way until his time. Uh, his, he had his colorful history, too, in the, in the United States Army, and then as brewmaster there for, uh, for many, many years. So anyway, with that, I take the pleasure in introducing our speaker from the evening, uh, Bob Penza. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, you know who I am, and I want to thank Bill for inviting me over to reflect on the family. And a lot of things evolved from this family, and uh, I'd like to bring you up to date on it. Well, first of all, <clears throat> last time I spoke was in a, it wasn't a historical society, it was a, the Lions Club in, uh, in Smithville. It's been a while ago, so I forgot everything I said then, so I won't be repeating anything. Um, this is being a historical society. We have to go way back in time. I suggest that we go all the way back to the caveman. And the reason why I mention that, <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed, but every once in a while you see a a cartoon or something of a caveman. And what does he have? He has a club in one hand, and in the other hand, he has his woman by the hair, and he's dragging her along the ground. Now, if you reflect on that, you say, gee, I guess women didn't get much respect in those days. You know what I mean? So, of course, I understand even today, a lot of women in some countries don't get too much respect. But in this country, I think they do rather well. So as the time rolls on, they came a long way. But then <clears throat> the uh, 19th century come around. And <clears throat> here you had a case where, uh, I guess it still goes on to some degree, but a lot of men were drinking, getting drunk, coming home and beating up the wife. And they were getting a little tired of it. And they organized these uh, women's organizations, and they had a lot of clout with the voters and uh, with Congress. So little by little, they pushed their way in, and they convinced Congress that we should not produce any more alcohol. Now, you've got breweries and all kinds of places producing alcoholic beverages. So they haggled on this for a while, but the women actually pushed this thing through, and it became known as the prohibition area, or the Roaring Twenties, or whatever you want to call it. 
Now, to get this in the proper perspective, I was born in December of 1929, so I missed the Roaring Twenties. All I know is what my family told me and what my friends told me, and also I would run into friends of my father and others who were in the business during Prohibition. So apparently it went into the Roaring Twenties. Now the only thing you got to keep in mind, the breweries, Budweiser and all those big breweries back then, they were producing beer. The beer had about 3.5 percent alcohol in a, in, a, in a glass of beer. It's 3.5 percent. Now, you all right? Now, uh, what they were doing, the breweries were allowed to still produce beer, but it had to be near beer. Near beer being less than 3.5 percent alcohol. You all right? All right. Yeah, if you stand a little bit behind it. Behind it? Okay. All right. So uh, the regular beer they had been producing was 3.5%. And now the near beer they had to produce during prohibition was going to be less than one half of 1%, less than 0.5. So now. They would still be able to serve this in the bars and what have you. So then all these so-called bootleggers jumped on the bandwagon and they said, well, they could make a buck here. So what they did, they produce alcoholic drinks or they produce alcohol itself. So here, a lot of these people who used to be beer drinkers carried a little flask inside their jacket which had alcohol in it. So uh, they'd buy the beer, and then when nobody was looking, they'd pour a little <laughs> shot of alcohol in it. So now instead of drinking 3.5% as they had been drinking before, now they were closer to 13%. <laughs> so they could be able to get drunk faster and a lot cheaper. So this wasn't working. Uh, so now, as time went on, well, uh, first of all, I would bump into uh, people that knew uh, my father and whatnot uh, as I went through life. Now, I, uh, I grew up in the brewery, so I, I don't really remember anything until maybe I was 10 years old or so. But, 12 years old, they had me working in the brewery during the summer months, and it was tough work. Uh, I mean, we didn't have forklifts. You had to lift all the cases by hand, a couple thousand cases on a truck or a, a freight car, and you had to handle the 700-pound drums. Two guys would pick up one end and stand it up, and uh, then you had to roll it. You didn't have any uh, forklifts or anything like that. That's why I have a bad back today, but I've learned to live with it. <laughs> uh, at any rate, as these Roaring Twenties went on and uh, people began to realize that this wasn't working because not only were they getting drunker and they were having a hell of a time, as they called it, the Roaring Twenties, they were enjoying themselves and the government was losing out on all the tax money that they should have been collecting on the alcoholic beverages. So they were losing all the way around. And apparently we live in a country that has a system where when you finally wake up and realize you made a mistake, you have a chance to correct it. So in the process, they finally realized that they couldn't handle it anymore. And they gave in. and. Uh, they got rid of the provision, they appealed it, and that was the end of that. Now, my uh, father was called Doc Penza, and there was uh, Uncle Charlie, and Uncle Louie, and Uncle Jimmy. Now, Doc, he, uh, he was the oldest, and they ran this farm on Middle Road when they were young. and. Uh, 
he got into the bootlegging movement, but then after they appealed it, I mean, it was all shot. So he sold it to Uncle Charlie for 500 bucks, the whole brewery. So, uh, but Uncle Charlie had to make it legal. So you see, I don't really mem remember anything until it became legal, but these are the things they tell me. And then another thing about the Roaring Twenties, when I was in my house, I decided to go out and buy a bedroom, no, a, a dining room set. And this fellow in Glassboro, Robert Weir, he had a furniture store there, and he sold some nice furniture, so I figured I'd go see him, so I looked him over and I, I saw a nice dining room set, which I still have today, and when he asked me my name and I told him who I was, he says, you weren't related to Doc Penza. I said, yeah. I said, it's my father. He says, well, I'll be damned. He said, he and I used to be bootleggers together. <laughs> I said, well, so he said, I got to tell you a story. Now, this is probably one of the most interesting stories I've heard. He said, at one time, they had made some booze in Atlantic City. And they had to get this booze to the Bellevue Stratford in Philadelphia. Well, they had rigged up a hearse. And in the hearse, there was a casket. They would put the booze in the casket, lock the casket, and get ready, and we'll make the trip to Philadelphia. So while they're going along, they were speeding. So this policeman on a motorcycle, he stops him. And they tell him, gee, we, sorry, he says, but we got to get this body to the Bellevue Stratford as soon as possible. Well, the policeman said, wait. He turns on his siren, he says, follow me. So he, he starts up the motorcycle, and away they go, screaming the motorcycle and the hearse following behind. So he takes him to the Bellevue Stratford. So when they get there, they get out and they give him a ten dollar tip and he turned out to be a pretty nice guy he had no idea what he was doing <laughs> but uh, this is the kind of things that went on in those days and uh, as i say i wasn't around to see it but i would run into people and they would tell me <laughs> these stories that were a little bit crazy so it gives you an idea what the roaring 20s were doing at that particular time uh let's see now so as I said, I grew up in the brewery, and uh, now Uncle Charlie, he didn't have a son, so he and I got along pretty well. And uh, we spent a lot of time just talking about things, and uh, he had two daughters. And uh, it was, uh, well, it was, having these four brothers were like having four fathers, you know? <laughs> they were all pretty good to me, and uh, I respected them all. As a matter of fact, I enjoyed it, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. So, at any rate, uh, let's see how they go. Now, when I was a kid, Uncle Charlie and John McKeezy, they had a racehorse. And this racehorse was doing lousy. And they got a little tired of spending money to take care of him. So he called me in one day, he says, you got a horse. So he gave me the racehorse to take home and keep it as a riding horse. So I went and picked it up and brought it home, and uh, it was a pretty nice horse. And uh, the only problem with him was that when you'd go to get on him, he'd swing around and bite you on the hip and kick you in the groin. And this was a little bit of a problem. But my father said, well, that's no problem, because he had horses when he was on the farm. And he says, you just take your fist and give him a little pop in the mouth. And then all of a sudden, he, he's lost his focus. And while he's losing it, you jump on his back. And it worked fine. Just a little, just a little dab to get his attention, you know what I mean? So he knew a lot of things I didn't know. <laughs> but otherwise, I would have never rode the damn horse, you know? <laughs> So, and uh, as a matter of fact, Mike, uh, he rode my horse, Mike Perna here. He, uh, all the guys I knew really well got kicked by my horse. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see what else you got here. 
And another thing, when I did work there, everybody in the brewery smoked and drank beer at the same time. That was normal. I mean, you hear all these people, you can't smoke, you can't drink. They were all smoking and drinking at the same time, so I accepted this as a fact. I never smoked. And the reason why I never smoked, when I'd go to work with my father, he'd have a cigar or something and he'd have the windows closed. And by the time we got to the brewery, I used to stagger out of the damn car. I couldn't breathe, you know? And I said, he's crazy. I said, I'll never do that. To... So I never smoked. So he did me a favor, I guess. Let's see. And let's see, according to me. Now, as I was growing up there, a lot of times, I mean, being a kid, I, I, beer was all around me, so I drank it, you know? And there were times when I drank near a quart of beer for lunch with a big sandwich, and I never got drunk. I've never been drunk in my life for some reason. And uh, it's strange for a brewmaster, but uh, I've never been drunk in my life. So these are some of the things I want to bring out. I was about 16 years old then, I guess. Uh, let's see, everyone smoked. Yeah, so now from the horses, I had that horse and I bought another horse. And then <clears throat> when the Atlantic City racetrack opened up, I got a job there in the stables, taking care of horses and giving them a bath and all that sort of stuff. And I was fairly big. I mean, you know, as you can see, I'm pretty, but they, they let me exercise a few, but of course I could never be a, a jockey. So, but I exercised a few and uh, it was interesting there. I, I enjoyed the racetrack. I met a lot of people there. I met uh, Bob Hope and a lot of these movie stars would come around there. And it was interesting. Now, one, one day a horse got away and he's running through the stables and he's running wild. It was a stallion. So then I see this guy going after him and he's got this mare behind him. And after a while he comes back. He's got the mirror and the stallion's following the mirror back to the stable. So that's one way of getting him back into the barn. So I learned that <laughs> as we went along here. Let's see the rubber here I got. <clears throat> and so these uh, women were able to pull that off, and I thought that was pretty good. This one here. And my brother Carmen, he was older than I, maybe six, seven years older. He also grew up in the brewery. And uh, in the beginning, my uncle Jim was the brewmaster, but then they needed him elsewhere. And then Carmen was the brewmaster. And then they needed him in the, run the bottle house. And then they would hire people to either be the brewmaster or the beer chemist. And a lot of them would just work for a while, then they'd quit, and it took a long time to teach them to be these things. And uh, they were getting a little tired. And finally, when I did come home from the Army, they says, as soon as they got things going on, they says, you're going to be the brewmaster and the beer chemist, and you're not going to quit and you're not going to die, because one guy had died on a job. So. <laughs> so I had to accept that. I had a good clause in there, you know. But I never died. They all did, but I'm still here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, now, Carmen, uh, my brother Carmen, he, was, he went into the Army, and uh, I was a kid much younger than him. And, he was in the D-Day invasion. He was only 18 years old, and he was in the D-Day invasion, and he fought from uh, France all the way to Berlin, and he was there when they gave up. Then they put him on a ship. They were bringing him back home. He was supposed to go to Japan, because they still were fighting Japan. And then on the way home, he told me they got word that ship Japan had surrendered with the atom bomb. And he said, you never saw such a party in the middle of the ocean. He said, these guys went crazy. They were pretty happy about that. 
Alright. Yeah, Uncle Charlie and I hit it off pretty well, so we were out uh, in the theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I served in the Army too, but it was in the Korean time. As a matter of fact, I. I was about 22 when they, they drafted me into the Army. And <clears throat> I had been in college for a while, and I was pretty good in physics and sciences. So when they did finally get me in there, and they told me, they said, with your background, you could be a weatherman in the Army, and said, we need them. And uh, so they more or less decided I was going to be a weatherman, they sent me to school. And it was very interesting. Uh, here again, these jobs are pushed on me, and they happen to be interesting jobs, and uh, I enjoyed them. I wouldn't have it any other way. So here, I go to school, I think four months or whatever it is, they give you a crash program, and they make a weatherman out of you, and then I, I go down to the Fort Monmouth. I was in Fort Monmouth. I was in the Signal Corps. Then you go down to the um, weather station, and we're forecasting weather and all this sort of thing. And things are going along fine. Then I go home for uh, Christmas holidays. So I'm home a couple of days, and the day before Christmas, I get a call from the Army. They said, we've got some bad news for you. They said, the, a fellow up on Mount Washington in New Hampshire, a weatherman, he went off the side on uh, uh, ice and whatnot, and he got killed. And they said, you're his replacement. So this is how I get these jobs. <laughs> so here, the day before Christmas, I got to jump in the car and drive all the way up to New Hampshire, 500 miles. So I never met the guy that I took his place because he was dead, but I saw the the um, the ice cat that he had that he went over the side with. And uh, it's a little hazardous, but I mean, any, anybody with common sense could handle it. So here I was on top of Mount Washington now, we'd work uh, like three days and then you have three days off, which was fine, I could go somewhere, you know. But you were up there for three days, you stayed up there, regardless of the weather. And it was, uh, it was interesting because there were some really big storms up there. Now, I've been in winds, high winds up to 238 mile an hour. Now, I was surprised. It would blow me around, slam me against the building, all sorts of things, but it didn't pick me up. I would say you need about 350 to pick me up. Because I could feel, I mean, you know, it was really it was something you, you got to see it to believe it, the way that thing slams you around. And this is in the winter, then in the summertime, I was up there for about a year. In the summertime, See, in the wintertime, we had two guys up there, but in the summertime, there was only one guy. You were up there all alone. So in the summertime, you had to go, you had to go out every hour and take a reading. And coming back into the building, I'm about six foot away from the door. And the storm is carrying on, and all of a sudden, a bolt of lightning goes between the door and me at head level, and it hits the lightning rod. And I thought it had hit me. And uh, here, for a moment, I was stunned because now if it had hit me, there was nobody there to pick me up, you know? <laughs> so uh, it was about as close as it will ever come to my being killed, I guess, because uh, a couple more steps then it would have gone right through me. But, uh, and ever since then, I lost all my respect for lightning, I noticed. Because <laughs> I said, if you can't do a better job than that, the hell with you. Uh, so uh, eventually I got through the Army and uh, everything went along good. Now one thing, when I did get to be the brewmaster, uh, a fellow for, called me from Ottawa, Canada. He says, I'm drinking your near beer. And he says, I realize it has a little bit of alcohol in it. And uh, he said, uh, how much do I have to drink 
for it to bother me. So I said, well, how much do you drink a day? He said, a oh, case and a half to two cases. I didn't want to lose him for a customer. <laughs> so I said, uh, she's case and a half to two cases. I figured it out. He was drinking the equivalent of about five or six bottles of beer. And he had diabetes and also, of course, I have it now, but, but he, so I explained to him, I said, uh, you, you're still drinking a little alcohol, but, but I, I can't understand how he handled all the water, the liquid. I mean, I mean, I, I, that's a lot of liquid. But I didn't want to lose him as a customer anyway, so I, I took care of him. Uh, let's see, I was in there, career. So at any rate, yeah, when I came back, uh, they were waiting for me. The, I got out of the Army in the morning from Fort Monmouth. I drove home. They had me working in the afternoon, so I didn't even get the day off. Uh, yeah, my Uncle Jim was the brewmaster early on, and Carmen, he was the brewmaster for a while, but as I said, they moved them into other jobs, and the job had to be mine, and I, I got stuck there for quite a while. Matter of fact, there's a fellow who used to work for me here, I noticed, uh, George, and uh, he was a good handyman at the brewery. We had him. And let's see, we got the auto in. Yeah, yeah what helped me in the Army was the, the way I handled physics in college and all. Now, a guy was talking to me the other day about these people that they say they've been here before and they like they played the piano or they did something and all of a sudden this kid knows this stuff you know and it sounds a little corny but when i took physics i had never gotten into it much and it seemed like it came to me awfully easy and i often wondered about that if i had it somewhere else because a lot of times i would finish a test in 20 30 minutes they'd be pondering over there for an hour and they didn't finish it. So this is the only time, I mean, um, I, I've wa wondered about it, but I, I know I've heard about these kids, young kids playing the piano. I have a grandson who's here, he played the piano, and he, he had to study for years. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he came all the way down from Boston, and he just got here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, you wonder about these things. I don't know the answers, but I wonder about them. Okay, the lightning and the wind. Now, as the brewery went on for years, you know, the microbreweries come into play. And they would start making home brews. This had gone out of style. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the big breweries took over, but then the microbreweries started to make a comeback. And they were making some pretty good brews. And then this one brewery, Brooklyn Brewery, I believe it was called. They came down to see me from Brooklyn, and they wanted me to make some beer for them. So I, I always listened to people, because they came from all over the world for me to make things for them. So this, uh, this fellow, he tells me what he wants and what on. So I, I look at him, and I figure, I says, I can't make that. I says, I spill more than that when I make a brew of ours. I'm making like 720 barrels of beer in a brew. And they're talking like uh, 20, 30 barrels. I mean, I, I spill more than that. So I never got into the microbrewery. Uh, but later on, uh, we were making some beer up in Utica, New York, at the FX Matt Brewing Company. I used to go up there a couple times a week and uh, keep an eye on things. And they were making Sam Adams beer. And we... I kept an eye on his, and we were brewing that beer. Then eventually he got big enough. Now, he was a, he came from a microbrewery. And eventually he got big enough, and he bought his own brewery in Pennsylvania somewhere. But uh, apparently his was pretty good, and it turned out all right. But up there in uh, Utica, it was a, a nice family, the FX Matt Brewing Company, and the... Uh, I got along real well with them. They were, they were all right. And I would drive back and forth. Now, once in a while, on that drive back and forth, once in a while, I remember once there was a big snowstorm, and on the way back, 
I must have seen about 40 accidents along the road because of the icy conditions and the tractors and trailers off this side and that side. And I was amazed at how, how many vehicles had left the road. I had never seen so many in one. It was icy conditions, but that's part of the game. Let's see. And over. <laughs> Now, one thing I want to point out, as I said, Uncle Charlie and I got along pretty good. Now, in the course of my lifetime, I, I took to the water. I like to go swimming and water skiing and all that sort of stuff. So, as I, I had bought this house on the corner of Marlin Avenue there, and I considered building a swimming pool out back where I have this big garage now. But as I thought about it, it would get in my way, plus I'd have all these uh, problems that go along with it. So then I started to think, I, it hit me on the way going down cellar steps, I remember. He says, why not build a community pool close to your house so the kids could walk to it and I wouldn't have all that trouble. So I talked to Uncle Charlie, I told him, I, I want to build a pool and I want to use because he had lots of, we had lots in there and he owed me a couple of favors mm -hmm. and we discussed it. He said, well, I got these two lots behind the Howard Johnson restaurant. <coughs> he says, we'll make a deal and uh, I'll give you these two lots and you put the, uh, this way the people will have somewhere to go to get refreshments or whatnot. So that turned out pretty good because that swimming pool. Now, when I built it, I was a little concerned that, you know, some kid might drown and I was going to feel bad. But it's over 50 years and nobody drowned. So uh, I'm starting to feel good about it. <laughs> and, and another thing, they gave me a lifetime membership. So that is another reason why I can't die. <laughs> I'd lose the damn membership. <laughs> so I, I go there once in a while, and I, I like to go to the river too to swim because uh, the water's cooler and more refreshing. But it turned out pretty good, and uh, I, I enjoy I, I enjoy seeing these kids enjoy themselves swimming. So at, in effect, the evolution of the brewery turned into the evolution of the Hamilton Swim Club because. I don't know if there would have ever been one otherwise, because the fact that I liked the water and he had the lots and he owed me a favor, that's your Hamilton Swim Club. So that worked out pretty good. Uh, let's see. Now, one thing, as we know, I was a, a brewmaster and a weatherman. I had no idea how unique that was. Now, I used to take my kids down to Florida in the wintertime, and we'd go to Clearwater. There was a guy who had a, these big three-masted sailboats, and we'd go for a ride. He'd take us out <coughs> in, the, in the Gulf there, and we'd go sailing. Now, this guy had a habit. Every time he brought in, I think he'd take six people at a time or whatever it was, he would ask him, what do you do for a living? So when he asked me, I said, well, I brewmaster and a weatherman is what I've been. So he said, all right. So I come back 15, 20 years later with one of my grandsons. We flew down, just to go check it out. I wanted him to learn how to fly and all that stuff. But the pilot wouldn't let him drive, so I don't know. But at any rate, we went down and we got on one of these boats. Now, I didn't know if it was the same guy that I knew from way back, and he didn't know me. But when he asked, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I've been a brewmaster and a weatherman. He said, oh, I remember you. I said, really? He says, yeah, how many brewmasters and weathermen do you think there have been in the world? Because <laughs> people come from all over the world to go there. And uh, I had, then from that on, it hit me. I was rather unique, and I didn't really pick out either profession. They picked me out, you know, the Army. And uh, so it's a rather unique situation. I see the swim club. Uh -huh. So I enjoyed that. I did a, a lot of water skiing. Uh, 
My daughter's learned how. As a matter of fact, my daughter is here tonight. She just came back a while ago from Vermont, where she rode bikes and all for a couple of weeks, but she finally water skied there, and she went all around that lake with no trouble. And she's in her 50s now, and she can handle it. I didn't have to tell everybody how old you were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have some things here that you can look at later, but uh, we enjoyed boats of all kinds because I had the I had everything from canoes, rowboats, uh, speedboats. I had about three speedboats. I had a cruiser, so we we played with them all and uh, we had a good time at it. And and also. The boats took me away from the swimming pool for a while, but then I finally went back to the swimming pool. Now, this book that I wrote, The Reflection of the Brewmaster, uh, well, this is actually a picture of the cover here. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's available on the internet. And uh, of course, I have flyers in here, which anybody wants one, they could have one. But all you gotta do is punch in the Brewmaster, Robert C. Penza, and it'll come up on the internet, and there are all sorts of people trying to sell it, so you pick out the one that gives you the best price. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, you'd be surprised how they're, they're selling it even in different languages, I don't know. But uh, it is available. So we'll see how that goes. Let's see. And there are some pictures in the book. I only have one copy, which is mine. And there are some pictures in the book, and uh, yeah, let's see. Now, as far as uh, staying alive a while, I remember a guy at the brewery told me, he says, I can tell you in two words how to live a long life. And he says, Stay alive. That's all, that's all it takes. <laughs> Two words. So I've been working on it, and it seems to work. But I do exercise a lot. And uh, now, in the, I never took doctors too serious, and I learned that from my mother because when I was 14 years old, the doctor wanted me to have my appendix out. So my mother said to him, "Well." She wasn't too much on doctors either. She said, uh, well, isn't there anything else you can do? He said, well, put an ice pack on it. We'll see what happens. That was 65 years ago. <laughs> I'm still waiting. And in the course of the lifetime, I've turned down five operations. And these fellows who wanted to operate, I told them, I'll, I'll catch you, I'll get back to you. So they were waiting, but a lot of them aren't waiting anymore because they're dead. <laughs> so, I don't know. See, one of the problems is that uh, in this society, if the insurance or something pays for it, you need it, you know? So you got to be careful of that. Uh, let's see. How am I doing on my time? Where am I? You got lots. You got another 30 five minutes. minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes? Okay. All right. Uh, let me see where I am. Hold on. Right. Yeah, Uncle Charlie, uh, back then, we were building Howard Johnson restaurants. He wanted to get into that. And uh, I'd go with him, and we picked out different sites, and we had them all over South Jersey. And now there are no Howard Johnson restaurants, and there is no brewery but the Hamilton Swim Club is still here. <laughs> so that swim club evolved because of those other two things. And it's going strong, and I'm glad of that because I do enjoy seeing them enjoy themselves there. Is there the room is? Uh, yeah, in the, uh, down at the river there, my other grandson, he bought a boat now, and. Uh, he fools around with boats, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, he enjoys it. Uh, Robert, the one who's here, he's a musician, mu musician. and uh, 
he he plays the trumpet and he, he took music at the Boston University and uh, he's pretty good and he married a girl from uh, she was there too she was from Cape Town South Africa and a very classy lady speaks the King's English and all that sort of stuff and she plays the violin and they both play the piano and they both teach at a conservatory up there about 25 miles south of Boston and uh, I went up to see them a week or two ago and uh, I was uh, amazed that uh, well we saw him perform in one of these outdoor theaters and it was a, a very interesting trip and uh, my daughter Sharon took us up and she's a pretty good kid let's see what else we got here That's the nineteen ten. Oh, <laughs> when I was in the boating and we were at water skiing, I guess some of you remember in May's Landing, they had a nudist camp, and uh, well, we would. Well, sometimes we water ski that way or river sometimes. So when we'd be down there, all these guys on these boats would be parked by the nudist camp and they're there with their binoculars and <laughs> checking all these girls in. Uh, so once in a while, there'd be an opening. And when we would ski on one ski, we'd lean back and we could send a spray up 25, 30 feet in the air. So if there was an opening where we can get in, these people that were lying on the deck getting their suntan, We'd come in with the boat, and I'd, I'd spray them from about 20 feet away, and that spray would go all over the dock, and they'd, they'd all jump up. And then, and then you could see everything, you know? <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. And one, one, day, one day, I even broke down out there, and I had to go in and use their telephone. I remember that. And there's a girl comes out, and she wraps herself in a towel, and she comes out. And uh, it was something, now it's not there anymore. So, um, and also a lot of things have changed. You can't really water ski in a lot of places anymore. I mean, we used to water ski all over the place. Uh, but times have changed, and uh, it's been interesting. So, let's see, what else we got here? Oh, we did a lot of snow skiing, my kids and I. We, we got into that, too, and... Uh, Fell a lot of times, and you, well, you know, you, once in a while you read about somebody r ramming into a tree. Well, one time I'm going through the woods trying to get from this trail over to the other trail, and I didn't feel like going all the way around. So while you're coming downhill, I see this tree's in front of me, and I have nowhere to go, but it's a small tree. And I grabbed that sucker, and she went down, and she went right between my legs. And I looked back, my skis go one on each, one on each side. I said, if somebody follows me, they'll be trying to figure out what the hell happened. <laughs> that was something. A lot of crazy things happened. So you got your 30 minutes yet, or what? Okay. All right, well, I enjoyed uh, talking to you, and uh, it was an interesting life. As I said, uh, everything went my way and uh, I wouldn't change anything. So. Not a question, it's a artifact. Did you ever do a, a brand of beer called New Beer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had to. Let me show you that. I was a missionary, believe it or not, in Japan. Oh yeah, I've had people from okay, all over the world. Okay, here's what happened. I wrote down. Yeah. I wrote down exactly this was oh, yeah, 1984. Yeah. But I got to tell you the story because this is I put this on Facebook, but the yeah. Facebookers know the story. Right? I was in a restaurant. I even wrote down where the restaurant was. I was in Japan in Honkyu basement in the right. train station in a restaurant. We were with a bunch of expatriate, like young people who yeah. were English teachers and stuff. Yeah. The Australian guy couldn't help himself. He said, "I've this new beer. I've got to order this beer." <laughs> they like this well, beer, so we ordered this, right? And I said, "Let me see that," because they were all laughing, and that Japanese censors had airbrushed a bikini <laughs> over the boobs of the model. I'm not kidding. You can see it. I'll pass it around. 
And I wrote down exactly what it was. So I look, I said, let me see that airbrush, because everybody's cracking up. And then I look at the label, it says Hamilton, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah actually, what happened yeah. here, a fellow What are the chances? People, people come from all over the world for me to make beer for them. Matter of fact, uh, uh, the physician of uh, Saudi Arabia, oh, oh I'm sorry. We don't, want to, we don't want to get out of people the last night. <laughs> the physician from Saudi Arabia came to me one time, and he wanted me to make a near beer for them. But near beer in their country is less than one-tenth of one percent. And it wasn't feasible for me to be boiling all that time, so I turned, I turned a lot of them down. But this guy, he came from California, and he wanted to make a nude beer. So he come up with this label, and he said, uh, well, I could, you know, let him pick out a beer he liked, and so he would make it. Now, in the beginning, the girl was new, and then they ran into a few trouble, and so what they did, you know, they used to serve this in bars and all. They put a bra on her, but it was a scratch-off bra. <laughs> so the, the guy at the bar, he buys it. It's got a bra on it. If he doesn't like the bra, he scratches it off. So he did pretty well with that. It was his idea. But we, we put it up for him. And uh, But I would get people from all over the world that would come back to me and say, I found your beer out in some island in the Pacific or something like that. And Because uh, we did sell beer all over the world. How many labels did you produce, Bob? Oh, hundreds, hundreds. See, people would come to us with all different types of ideas. And I'd talk to them, and if it was feasible, and if we could make a buck, I'd say, all right. But if it wasn't feasible, well, some things weren't feasible. Yeah. This was feasible. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got a kick out of it, too, uh, a lot of the guys. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate that. I yeah. forgot all about the beer. But, yeah. but it's it's right. just, I never thought that I'd run into Hamilton Project. Yeah, I'm the guy who made it. And, uh, I know. It's good. I was like, yeah. let me say that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I gave him the okay on that because it was no problem. I could just use whatever beer he chose, and uh, the scratch off label was his problem. So, I mean, <laughs> we let him worry about that. Is there any more but, questions uh, for Bob or any uh, contributions? Bob, you want, to yeah. your, you want to introduce your family? Well, my daughter and my grandson. How many years were you as a brewmaster? Uh, well, the brewmaster itself, I was probably about 30, 35 years. But I worked there in different capacities. I was in the office. I was in the office a while at the desk when the people come in. And I met guys like Nucky Johnson and all these they even come in to see Uncle Charlie because he was the political boss of the area. But the brewmaster, as I said, they told me I had to do it and I wasn't going to quit and I had to do both jobs, the brewmaster and the... Because they got tired of these people quitting or dying, you know? <laughs> so, um, and Uncle Jim, and well, he, he was running the office and Carmen was running the bottle house. So they tried to, tried to keep a close hand on everything and uh, it worked out all right. I, uh, I enjoyed it, and uh, I drank a lot of beer then, and uh, it was a good, a good experience. And uh, I'm glad that my grandson was here to hear it because I want him to know that I had a good time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, is that enough for you? Thanks, Bob. Okay. Oh, if anybody's interested in ordering the book, you just punch in. Reflections of the Brewmaster, Robert C. Penza, it'll come up all over the place. Okay. And uh, just order wherever you get the best deal. You know? I, mean, I just want to tell a, uh, a Uncle Charlie story. As I was interviewing uh, Paul Condy for an uh, article I have not yet written, and he was talking about that he was uh, in uh, World War II, he was in sixth grade selling war bonds. And um, anyway, he went and had three people to see. I forget the one, the first one. The second one went to Jake Shank, and he got, he got uh, a good contribution. And there was a contest. And then he went to uh, Eastern Brewing. He knocked on the door, a little nervous. <laughs> he drew his bike there. 
and uh, they ushered him in to see uh, Charlie. And uh, Charlie uh, pushed the intercom. Uh, we told him what he wanted, and he said uh, to write this boy a check out for a thousand dollars. So Paul went. I said absolutely won the contest in, <laughs> in Hamilton Middle School. But I know Charlie was a great supporter of many things. Yeah, he was all right. As I say, he had no sons, and he and I sort of clicked. And then when he gave me the horses, I did the, <laughs> the turn it to. I mean, I enjoyed the horses. I had a lot of fun with them, and. Uh, it was, as I say, I, I, it was like having four, well, see, Uncle Louie, he was a farmer, and uh, I would go out and help him on the farm when I was a kid. But Uncle Jimmy always worked at the brewery, and uh, we had a good time. And, and now, another thing, I, over, I, I overlook a lot of things, but Uncle Charlie had a, a box down at the racetrack when they opened, and I would go down and use his box. And... John B. Kelly had the box right in front of us. So I would see Grace Kelly and her sisters and brothers, and I got to know them. Now, as a young man, I said to myself, you know, you're trying to beat the horses, you know? So I said, well, he's the president of the racetrack, so he must know something. So I follow him to the window, and I watch what he bets. And whatever he bet, I bet it. I lost my shirt. <laughs> he lost every time. So that didn't work. So you learn a lot as you go along the way. He, he didn't know anything. He was the president of the track. <laughs> All right.